Well, good afternoon to all of our students. And uh, as we have done, this is an exciting moment with our Professionals by Pathway event, a career exploration event to help students connect their learning and career opportunities uh, to their future. I am Terry Pablo, I'm the CT Director, and I'm excited to welcome Trey Kirby, who I say is like the ultimate entrepreneur. Um, and as he just told me that uh, he has currently 11 ventures going on. And so we will have him share a lot of information with us today. But just as a reminder, we are recording this so students can look at this at a later date. And um, so we'll have the next 30 minutes to um, do some ex exploration in um, how to be an entrepreneur and what it takes to be successful at it. So um, let's just get started. Troy, welcome. Hi, how are you? Good, good. Good. It's always so, great to be with you, Terry. You do a lot for the community. Um, I've always been impressed. Uh, Terry, you know, for those students watching, actually goes and advocates for students in various other places, including Lacey, including Olympia. And then also when I've had opportunities to hire students, uh, she's been always advocating for even students that are just in her school district. So I think it's a great kind of, uh, kind of banner for you, you know, that great. you've done that. Thank you, Troy. We appreciate that. We, we, do, we are proud of the students here in Yelm and want to make sure that they have great opportunities and thank you for, for reaching out to us. Um, so I, there's so many ways that we can go in this conversation, but for the students from, from somebody who does the job, what is an entrepreneur and what are the most important skill sets uh, that you have found to help you be successful? Well, first off, an entrepreneur does not mean that you need to make a ton of money from the first venture that you do. An entrepreneur can be the kid that mows the lawn. You know, the little things that you do that make money, that means that you're kind of fashioning with, uh, outside the system. One thing that I would say to you is having a positive attitude. Um, there is so much negativism right now in this world. Um, I don't mean to be hippy dippy, but you know, like with the pandemic and everyone saying, oh, it's so horrible, blah, blah, blah. These are great times to find little facets of ways to generate money. Um, and it's not just to generate money for the sake of money's sake, but also the more uh, revenue streams that you have coming in, um, the more that you actually have the ability to kind of have a freer life. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, you're going to be a Kardashian overnight or Maybe, I hope not. But, you know, it, it does mean that you will have more financial security. You'll have more freedom. Um, when you mentioned, Terry, that I have 11 businesses, that doesn't necessarily mean that all those businesses are making thousands of dollars each day and blah, blah, blah. That's not how things work. Some will be up, some will be down. During this pandemic, I had several businesses that were down that were just down for the count. But... I had other businesses that supplanted that. So it helped me in financial security wise to know that I had, um, you know, some really kind of a buoy, right? And, yeah. you know, the thing for me was, you know, not to get down on things, not to get over leveraged, which is another issue. Um, I would tell everyone just kind of stay away from the credit cards, stay away from those things that, you know, just spending money for money's sake on, you know, small little things like video games or whatever, if, if it's not going to actually yield you a, a great reward, it's going to end up being something that you pay interest on several times over. So you buy that video game and you pay 50 bucks for it, but you do it on a credit card and that credit card has a 29.9% interest, right? Over a year. I mean, you're, you're paying well over what, 27, 28 bucks for the thing. I mean, that's, you know, that to me is not, you know, worth it. And you have to look at along those lines in any kind of venture that you do, how it's generating money, but how you can also ensure that you're not uh, over leveraging yourself, you're not creating a negative attitude or a negative atmosphere. So I guess that would be the first thing, you know, and I know that that doesn't, that sounds way high level, but a lot of the things that you um, talk about, how do you get started? Well, you can get started as long as you can sell something that was worth 50 cents for a dollar, you made 50 cents. It doesn't need to be this grandiose, massive amount of uh, inventory or massive amount of stuff. And you can get into that as well as anybody. But 
I, I genuinely think that's one of the issues that people have is they get overwhelmed by the idea that they're going to have to spend so much money in order to make something. Not really yeah. necessarily the case. Well, I heard you say a couple things in there. Um, number one is, is that you need to really be balancing your decision making. And so it's looking at the plus and minuses of a situation and thoroughly evaluate them. So I kind of heard a little bit about that and probably textbook wise, that's a cost benefit analysis. Um, you do a little bit of that evaluation um, and some of that decision making. And then you didn't really talk about this, but I'm gonna probe a little bit further. Sometimes you said it's not about the money. What else might a venture be about? I mean, how, how do you decide what it is that you go after because you, you, know, you wanna run that kind of business? Because I know you, you have sports teams that you, you know, have, you've had um, restaurant businesses, you've had entertainment businesses. So you've got a lot of diversity in what you've done. Um, how do you decide which ventures that you go after? Well. One of them, you know, you mentioned the sports teams. I never thought we'd make money at it. I just wanted to kind of showcase some civic pride and to Lacey Washington with the Lacey Pocket Gophers. And it used my skill set. It allowed me to also get in the door with anything else because now I had a conversation starter. The Lacey Pocket Gophers have actually been better for me to start as a business, not for what I got out of it, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, but every other little business that it helped along the way, because people saw my marketing skill, my sk sales skill, whatever, because the entire time you're having to prove it, uh, whatever it is, people are always suspicious. Everyone always says they can sell something or they can do something, but until you prove it, people aren't really kind of going to fall along those lines. Um, I actually, with the pocket gophers, I was actually introduced to um, Andrew Barkas, who's actually a representative in uh, your district and uh, through Rotary. And he liked what I was doing and wanted me to do a bunch of uh, campaign stuff on uh, his 2018 campaign. That actually led to working with the state legislature. That actually led to working at TVW, the um, TV station. All of these things were like 45, 5,000 a month, not really doing a lot, and I was doing other businesses. That's the other thing is um, you can you can really do more and actually generate uh, you know more fun for yourself by doing contracts. You know, getting stuck at a job and you know kind of doing that. That's great if you want that security and you can still do those things. But if you want to kind of you know be able to do contracts, you want to do other things, you're going to end up making a lot more money because it sometimes takes less time and they'll actually pay you more money to do it. Charlie Safari was actually, I met a guy at a bar uh, who owned Charlie Safari and needed somebody to run it. So he's willing to give me 20% plus about 70,000 in a contract to run it for a year. Okay, um, now I have equity. Now, of course, that, that equity is now tied to some transport station somewhere because <laughs> it uh, got shut down now because of the pandemic. But, you know, at the same time, yeah, you still make money and it really wasn't that hard and it was a lot of fun. That's the other thing is, you know, it stops becoming a job when you actually find, uh, you know, kind of like fun into it. Uh, the TV station, I, you know, they, they hired me on because I had a positive attitude. I had met the president on a plane ride because we happened to be going to Atlanta at the same time. She sat next to me. We didn't talk to each other the entire time. And then... Um, you know, at the like last 10 minutes, she mentioned that she worked at TVW. And I said, I know where that is. She goes, no, you don't. I said, Olympia, I live right next to it. Well, two years later, there's an opportunity comes up. They need a host. I have some hosting experience. Guess what? We sign a contract for the next four months. I'm working for them. Doesn't mean I'm not doing anything else, but it means extra money that's coming in that I throw in. And why is that important? Because when we have the pandemic and everything shuts down, I have money to rely on. And it's not that I don't think the, I mean, I, you know, I, I really feel bad for those that, you know, with the unemployment system and everything else, I, I don't want that to come off as dismissive, but, you know, you have to make sure that you have a nest egg. So in case those government systems do not work as quickly as they should, that you have the ability not to have to sell all this, all your belongings in order to make it. So I don't want to sound insensitive. I hope that doesn't come off that way. So, but those are the, yeah, those are the types of opportunities that come from it. So. 
So, so I just heard you also talk about a really big skill, um, and one is networking, uh, but with networking requires communication and that ability to communicate with others. Um, so those two, uh, those are really big. And I think that students, as they're starting to build their careers, um, those are things that you learn over time. But how did you, you know, between networking and communication and running a business and, and all those things, where did you get your education? Where, how did you um, get to where you are? Well, number one, I do have a master's degree. I did go through all the stuff, I believe, fully in education. Don't let that, this whole idea that there's like this separation to me is not good either. Um, I did not uh, go to school traditionally until I was 25. It didn't mean that I didn't want to go to school. It was just those opportunities didn't exist. But, um, and it, having the ability to go to a community college, uh, Centralia College allowed me the ability to get into a radio station, et cetera. All of that comes from the idea of knowing that um, I needed to make sure that people knew who I was, uh, that they liked a good handshake, and that I had uh, really kind of an interest in other people. One of the things I will say, and this is not just for young people, but in general, a lot of people don't really take time to invest in somebody else. And to me, that's one of the shortfalls that you've got is, you need to listen to other people, their story, their stuff. Now, sometimes, look, some of these things are not going to yield out. Like you're going to, somebody's going to tell you some long story, whatever, that doesn't go anywhere. But the majority of the time, they, they really will tell you not only what they want, but if they like you, they're going to want to be involved with you. Um, you know, there's uh, countless examples of people that have liked other people that have made made it really, um, you know, their thing. Now I sent you a list of books and one of them is grinding it out. There's a milkshake guy and you can actually look at um, the founder. It's on Netflix. Um, he's 54 and he happens to go to San Bernardino and meet uh, the McDonald's brothers and they like him. And by liking him, they decide to allow him to franchise it. He would have had no ability to do this. To me, that's a that's an important step. Now, there are some things about you know the book that are not necessarily you know correlating. I think they're more for dramatic effect, you know. And we tend to look at business people as you know sinister or you know they're just going to undercut each other. Not necessarily the case. I think uh, a lot of times uh, people create their own narrative, especially when they sell out early and somebody else makes it big. But the whole point is. If people like you, they're more willing to do business with you. So I always try to be likable. Talking about divisive topics, probably not the best thing for you. Talking about things, and you know, that's one of the things actually I think also, you know, having the ability to communicate with other people, um, you know, really kind of yields out that, you know, you're you're really going to be able to be put into a role while you're working for somebody else that allows them to say, hey, I really want this person on my team to be rewarded and to be able to do the things that they want to do. So, you know, not be just being vocal to, you know, kick in the door every time you don't get your way, but, you know, saying, hey, I, you know, I like doing this. I like doing that. Great. We'll put you in those roles. That's what a good manager does. And I will say that's one thing my generation, Generation X has not done well, uh, especially for younger generation Gen Z is, we really don't manage very well because we somehow manage ourselves and nobody else. You know? Yeah. We'll blame well, the baby boomers for that. They didn't manage us. <laughs> I, I think that, you know, that's when we look at students and starting to practice this, right? You, you talked about, you know, networking happens over time and communication, you know, you got to practice it a little bit. Um, that's something students could get started with now. That's something that, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a risk. And um, it's sometimes not comfortable because we're not good at it yet. But what are some things that maybe students could start doing now to get comfortable, take that little bit of risk, maybe a, a supported risk, and build those skill sets? What do you think students could do right now? Well, the first thing that I would say is get out of your comfort zone, meaning it's great you have a network of friends. Go meet people that are outside your network of friends. Go meet 
five people a day that you've never met before. It's a little harder with the pandemic, but still, um, you know, be vocal, be nice, be, be a person that's approachable. Doesn't mean that you've got to, you know, just tell everybody your phone number the second you meet them. But, you know, being absorbed by this is not worth it. You know, it, it just isn't. And it, to me, it becomes an emotional loss leader too, because after a while, you stop kind of growing. You should be a lifelong learner. I, you know, added those books. You know, even if you're in the car and you're listening to books, you're still listening to somebody else's effort, somebody else's struggle that's gonna be great for you because it's going to help you learn that everybody is in the same boat, you know? And a lot of it, um, every, it, it always looks easy, you know, from this perspective. I'm still, you know, waiting for it to not get hard. It's always gonna be hard because the second it gets easy, it's just comfortable and you should worry about that as well. Um, but how did we meet? We met because we struck up a conversation. We didn't know each other. I don't even think we got introduced, but I think, you know, we walked up to each other at a, a networking event. I think it was uh, Thurston Chamber and started talking. That's how you do it. Ask questions, be inquisitive. I always ask people, you know, like, you know, what you're doing, what's interesting about your job, open-ended questions. Tell me about yourself. Biggest open-ended question. And being caring and listening. If you can't yeah. care, nobody's going to care about you. You know? Yeah, I, I think that's that's just right. Is when we we pay attention to people um, and show an interest, the door gets opened. And I think that when you meet people and you uh, get to know them a little bit more, those opportunities present themselves, like you described um, with TBW and, and things like that. Um, speaking of that, you've got some pretty heavy equipment right in front of you. Uh, looks like you got you know a big mic and different things. So you're doing announcing. You're doing what? What are you doing in that world? I mean, there's a lot of technology going on out there, and you're working from home and, and doing some pretty pretty cool stuff. How how do kids um start start in those worlds? Because technology is going to be a big part of how, as we move forward. Well, what's funny about this? Okay, so right now I am using this not uh, for a TVW job because uh, TVW was one thing, but there was a, another group of online uh, newspapers, Jolt, uh, the Journal of Olympia Lacey Tumwater, and then uh, a few up north that said, hey, we would like a briefer version of that. Can you do that? And I go, yeah, I've, I've got the software. I've got the equipment. Boom. So I get a $300 check every month for really only doing a Two minute video of just splicing together some stuff probably took me about half hour each day. I do it and I still get paid the other stuff, but it goes into, you know, a bank account and all of that stuff goes into its little increments of money. And, you know, that's the thing is right now with the availability of technology, if you, um, I know a lady that uh, makes uh, underwear and I know a lady that makes headbands. Now, they, that's not the only job they do, but they're able to sell on Amazon. They're able to sell on Etsy. They're able to sell on all that stuff. It matters because it gives you more opportunity. Your stores have expanded and you don't need the retail space. So I, and you also don't need the overhead of insurance. It's easier to, you know, mail stuff off. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, the world's growing. And so there are plenty of opportunities. You know, whatever you're good at, I mean, Let's say you're good at sewing, right? Now you can make clothing. Let's say you're good at food. You know, maybe you can like have a small uh, food, you know, vendorship. I don't know. Like there's just different things that you can do at a micro level that are going to yield out. And with the fact that the state allows a lot of home-based businesses, I know actually there's a lady up north and she's having some issues right now, but she created, and only because I own a cider bar, I know about her. But over in Greenwood, which is next to Ballard, she actually created her own bar out of her detached garage. I'm not saying you should do that because, you know, you're 18, 17. But think about, think about how, how much limits there are. You can do your own coffee stand. You can do your own, um, you know, lemonade stand. I don't know. But all of those things are entrepreneurship. The thing that um, especially young people get absorbed by is the idea that they have to make it to where they have to make enough to live on. Don't worry about living on it. But I will tell you the biggest assets that you have is not just communication, but also paperwork, time, and a good pair of work gloves. You know, um, 
right now, I would think, you know, if I'm young and industrious, I would start looking at all the places that are uh, throwing out scrap metals, things that you can just go resell to somebody else, throw it in a truck, throw it in something else, and then move it along. There are people that will pay you to, you know, take away stuff that they have. And there are auction houses that would love to take it. And, you know, that in between. I would um, also have a lot of people, and this is where math does come into it. I would have people look at net profit margin a lot. Net profit margin, a lot of people can't calculate it. And if they can't calculate it, a lot of times they're losing out, you know? So that also means not just what you paid for it, but also does that account for any of the taxes? Does that count for any of the other stuff so that you make sure that you actually make money? And whether or not it's 10 cents or $2 or $20, you know, an item, you want to make sure that you're making money each time that you do it, plus the effort that you put into it. I think effort is, you know, one, everything's hard work. And, and if you put the effort in and you enjoy it, that's one thing, but the, you use the word work a lot. Um, and the other thing is in that word, um, people don't know how to value their work and their labor and their time. And I, I hear that a lot from businesses who struggle to succeed is like, well, I don't want to charge them too much, or I don't want to do this, but then they devalue um, themselves and the amount of um, expertise they bring to it and the work that they're putting into it. How do you balance that as an entrepreneur in terms of, you know, charging and, and your contract work? How do you, how do you think about um, the labor and the, the hourly wage kind of idea? Well, first off, I, I do get out of the hourly wage discussion. I don't like that because that a lot of times, especially if you're doing contracts, you don't want to set an hour at all because if you set an hour, then you're actually beholden to require those hours. Um, I'll give you an example though. I The cider bar I have downtown, um, when I started it, I initially started it with one other person. They backed out and I had to learn a lot about hard cider. I had to learn a lot about stuff. But what I learned was if you carry more products that they can't find elsewhere, you can charge a higher premium overall. And you know, once you charge that higher premium, people will pay it because they want the service. You know, And maybe they can find it somewhere else, but they have to go travel somewhere else to go do it. That's part of it. The other thing is to mitigate your risks of your overhead. You know, uh, There were several places when we looked at the bar uh, that were like 3,000 months square footage plus triple net, which means you got to pay for utilities, you got to pay for water, you got to pay for all that stuff. I found a place that was $900 all inclusive and was only two blocks away. And everyone goes, oh no, that won't work because nothing's ever worked there. Well, that just means that you've got to you've got to really work harder at it. And what's funny is we get more traffic flow with less amount of customers and actually make more money than we would. If we'd spent at the other place, we'd probably be out of business because 3,000 overhead. I mean, that's quite a bit, you know, mm -hmm. over 12 months, especially if you get shut down. And that's the other thing, being creative when, you know, like the shutdowns and things like that, while every other bar was closed, mine was open because I utilized a retail part component. So I could be open at 25% capacity, which is fine because they're just retail going in and out. Well, that means that I was able to generate just as much money, you know, that way. You have to be creative. And, you know, in those things, the things that when I was, um, you know, starting the bar, there were things that I, I thought I knew, you know, because I'd worked in, you know, some bar environment before. But when it went to retail, I had to learn my customers over again. And that's the other thing is your net, you don't stop. So many people will give you an excuse on why they should stop or why they can't begin. And I, I can't help those people. They're, they're just, that comes back to the negative attitude. They're, if you're going to be in the negative attitude, then you will be paid by somebody else to do a job and that will be it. But you know, if you have the ability uh, to get paid more you know, and do it by contract or you know, whatever. I mean, I'd, I'd say go for it. The thing I always throw out with contracts is I always throw out, and this is a skill I had to learn. I always throw out in a proposal way more so they can kick it back. So they feel they're negotiating. And usually they don't negotiate as well as they think because I overexpand. And so I end up getting way more than I should have. So, and that's kind of on them. So that's a, kind of a trick. 
Um, you know, I will say, I didn't always, I mean, I, I've mowed lawns, I've done those things, you know, as young people, whatever, but I've also worked for other people. I worked for three college campuses. I worked for professional teams. I worked in sports for 15 years. I did other things. So it wasn't like I, I didn't, you know, um, do that. But while I worked for them, I also uh, kind of used it as a research and development department to understand different things. I didn't just sit behind the desk and just decide, well, this is my career or whatever. I, I did little things. Uh, when I was working at Eastern Washington University, um, I started a, um, a comedy thing for clean comedy. I had no interest in clean comedy, but I knew there were a bunch of people that complained they couldn't bring their kids to it or they, could, they didn't want to watch it because people were cussing. Great, we created clean comedy. The, and I did the same with uh, the Lacey Pocket Gophers. When I created that, I was told by the people that were around who had their own soccer team in Olympia that, well, I wouldn't be allowed into a team and you know, why would I form a team? I found out it's just paperwork and time and all, all you have to do is find other people to play and now you've got a league. Well, the thing is in both cases, both the comedy and uh, the, um, you know, the soccer team, by focusing on target markets, which I had learned from working at college campuses and learned from working in sports, I was able to draw out and pack audiences and pack paying audiences that would pay more than they would for the other alternatives in both cases. The pocket governors drew 300 a game. You go down to the Olympia one, they draw 30 and they barely have people in. I'm not dismissing them, but it's all marketing. The difference is, is that you will get people that will say, oh, well, you're not blah, 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 doing it right. I don't know what doing it right is. I just like generating money and I like people having fun. And that, those are the components. You're always going to have people that, whether they were the naysayers, the negative, the, the people that didn't, that wish that they had the audience you had, but they don't want to make the sacrifices in the marketing side, you know, they're always going to exist. My pocket gophers were everywhere. They went to they went to every event, opening of a postage stamp, they were there. Well, it creates name recognition. It's just what you have to do. So everything is about a hustle and there's always got to be a new hustle. So kids in school right now, we, um, you know, obviously they're learning in a new format and, and hopefully we'll be back to school soon at our secondaries as we've already started moving into our elementaries. But, but all that said, moving forward in education, um, when you were in high school, or if you were in high school today, what do you, when you're sitting in your English class, or you're sitting in your math class, if you were reflecting back now, what do you wish you would have done um, to make the most of those situations so that you'd be prepared for some of your experiences that you had in, in moving forward in your business? So what, what, well, what can school do for them now? Well, you know, I went to Timberline, um, which was, you know, pretty populous school. And then halfway through my sophomore year into my junior year, they actually moved half the kids to River Ridge. So it was like, it changed everything because there were all these wide opportunities that didn't exist because, you know, before you had had too many kids that wanted to do video club or too many kids that wanted to do things. And now all of a sudden it separated them all out. You have to look at opportunities. Look at what's available to you. Look at, you know, you have teachers that are paid there to not just educate you, but also to almost be your R&D department, you know? So right now they're, they are paid by the school system. So if you have a great, you know, idea for a dress or shoe or whatever, they're forced to have to kind of, you know, give you an evaluation. So you've, you've kind of got some extra help right there. Sorry to make that Terry, but you know, in a way kind of puts well, you on the spot, but. You know, and that's the thing, um, expert, right? You've got some teachers there who, you know, can help you with those math problems that you're trying to figure out to run your business. And you've got people who are experts in English and communication that can support you in writing your business plans and, you know, those, those kinds of things. And so I think that, you know, how do we help students realize that the, the, the assets they have in front of them to help them be successful? Perfect example of this. And it's in that is shoe dog. Shoe Dog is by Phil Knight of, um, you know, Nike. And when he started, he originally, his thing uh, for the Nike shoe, or what was called Blue Ribbon, was actually taking Japanese shoes over to the U.S. because they were better quality this back in the early 60s. 
he did that as a grab paper. And the only person that believed in him and helped him with it was his professor at Stanford. Everybody else, including the other students, just didn't think it was that interesting, whatever. But it led him on the way. It didn't mean that was the only source. But you know, when you have those assets and those resources, that's what's going to allow you to get better. You know, my aunt used to tell me that uh, she got jealous of me back even in the early 90s when I was in school because we would have personal computers. And she goes, yeah, you're, you guys have the ability to break them. You know, and if you think about that, you have the ability to kind of, and I'm, don't break computers, but, you know, you have the ability to overuse them and do other things with them. Um, you know, with anything, the major right now in this community, you also have a great asset in the Secretary of State, Kim Wyman, is in this county. And why is that a great asset? She's the one that sets up all the businesses for the entire state. I'm sure that if you reached out to her and said, hey, I would love to learn more about creating my own business, you can bypass the lawyers because the lawyers for a single entity LLC is not, you shouldn't even be paying them. But you know, you can register online yourself. She, she'd probably love to do a class like this. And the, the whole thing is, you, if you have assets, you need to use them. A lot of times people don't use the assets. They just kind of go along and they, you know, do their thing and then they screw up and then they wonder why they spent so much money on things that they didn't have to do. So that's, you know, really right now, you're, you're kind of their forced R&D department, Terry. Cool. So we're coming to the end here. Is there one last piece of advice you might give students today to um, help them make a plan for tomorrow? So what I would do is I would uh, keep a positive mindset. This is a great opportunity and a great time. You are not going to hear that from a lot of people because they are allowing negativism from social media to kind of absorb in, into them. If you have the ability to create, if you have the ability to understand how money works, which is all it is, is ec economics are just money changing hands. You know, you, you've got a great career ahead of you. And the one thing I would tell you is you can work for other people and still do stuff on the side. You can, you, you don't have to, you know, uh, be absorbed with the idea of binge watching. I would get out of that, by the way, those, that stuff will be there 50 years from now. So worrying about the last episode of Lost as opposed to putting a few things forward, it's not worth it. And the thing is, every little bit that you put forward now will look like a lot of stuff you put forward later, but you didn't, you know, all you did was set up the, the turnkey effort. So a lot of the things are turnkey. And once you set them up, uh, you, don't, you can't see the other side of my office, but it's full of, uh, you know, candy that's on racks. All I'm waiting for now is the ability and tattoos to refill stuff. And then I just go along my way and I collect money. So, you know, that those things were set up long ago. So they were paid for and now they just wait. Awesome. So take opportunity when it's there and, and um, don't don't be afraid of hard work and, and getting it there. So the number one book that I will tell you get but get the audio book. It's on the Terry Pablo's list is Me, Inc. It is by uh, Gene Simmons of Kiss. And you would think, why would I want li to listen to a rocker? Who cares? He has made far more money than the rest of his bandmates because of copyrights, because of trademark, and because of small things that he does from his desk that have nothing to do with the band. And to me, that is, it is tantamount to understanding how things work and what people are willing to pay for. Great. Well, I will be sure to post that information for our students. So if they would like to look at some books to help inspire them, uh, that would be, that's great that you've shared that. Well, thanks for your time today, Troy. And we appreciate um, all the advice you've given to our students. Yes. And I appreciate all that you do. Thank you. Thank you.